Yeah. And now, when you think of fashion at the Royal Ascot races, what comes to mind? Extravagant designs, perhaps? Quaint English styles, maybe? And who do you imagine to be behind such outfits? English, French, Italian designers? What about a Pakistani designer, or a designer of Pakistani origin, I should say? Omar Manzoor is a fashion designer from Pakistan, based in London, who's been doing an exclusive collection for Royal Ascot since 2009, and joins me now. Hello, how are you? Hi, well, I'm very well, thank you. You just tell me where your office is in Harringay Green Lanes, North East London, is that, is that right? Yes, it is. No, this is very London metropolitan of me, but that's a very nice part of the world, isn't it? And it's um, it's famed for its Turkish restaurants, amongst other things. Indeed, <laughs> that's the reason why I gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> why you gain, do you find yourself between... Because if you work in fashion, you're not meant to uh, necessarily gain weight, though perhaps you're challenging some stereotypes. I should say for any listeners that Omar is actually very, very thin and uh, doesn't look large in the slightest. Tell me a bit about how you got into fashion. What were you doing before? I mean, how does one become a fashion designer? I find it must be a terrifying uh, and slightly unstable career choice. There's no graduate scheme that you join. How did it happen for you? For me, it was a family uh, business. My fourth uh, generation previously were into textile business. And since I was very bad in maths and <laughs> everything, the only thing I was good in was in arts. And did you grow up over here or did you grow up back in Pakistan? I grew up in Pakistan. 11 years back, I came to London College of Fashion to do my degree in fashion. Can I ask you a question which you might find, um, uh, to use a word of the day, uh, somewhat offensive? Is do, Did people in... When you told people in Pakistan you were going to go and work in fashion, what was their response? <laughs> I came from uh, the third largest city of Pakistan, Faisalabad. Faisalabad, yeah. Yeah, that's a textile town. So when I said ah, okay. yeah, that I'm going to take the family business to the value addition level, Towards the ready-made garments, so yeah. I didn't. I avoid the word fashion and put it in the garments. Garments. I was going to say because there is an important distinction, isn't there, between textiles and garments, which come with certain sort of um, some people say colonial connotations, but not really. There, uh, that's a sort of that's a uh, an industry which people uh, respect in a way that people perhaps have less respect for fashion, particularly in in Pakistan. Is the fashion industry still somehow... I mean, there's obviously a very thriving uh, uh, fashion industry in Pakistan. But do you think people who would say that they're going to work in fashion would be a bit sort of frowned upon, that people would say that's not a very smart career choice? But if you say you're working in garments, then people say, ah, oh, that makes sense. Back in my days, it was the case. But nowadays, when I was there last month, I can see the fashion institutions are getting bigger in the fashion yes. weeks. Yes. And now the acceptability towards the society is way better than in my time. How do you describe the sort of fashion that you design, the sort of designer that you are? I mean, what are your big influences? I think uh, the Asian side, the embellishment embroideries, which I use on the Western garments. Yeah, so it's kind of Western garments as a base, and then you kind of have a final touch which suggests a kind of Asian influence, if you like, or heritage. Yeah, exactly. The fusion is the niche. I should have met you before I got married. I was trying to. I, I got married in a in a very very. Um, uh, how can I put this? Uh, kind of Maharaja type outfit, and. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe, I feel like maybe I got it slightly wrong. Um, anyway, it would have been good if we'd met before, and we could, you could have given me some advice and maybe sold me a better outfit. But what's your advice to young people trying to become fashion designers themselves? How do you, I mean, you obviously had a kind of family heritage where you had lots of your family had done it. Uh, what's your advice to young people who, are, who have ambitions and dreams to uh, follow your path and do the sort of thing you do? How easy is it to get started these days? Well, nothing is easy, actually, to be honest. If they even do a uh, doctorate degree or something like in getting to medics, they still have to work in long hours <laughs> and everything. And so is fashion. There's no shortcut to success. So, yeah, it's challenging, but it does pay you back. If you prove your metal, it does pay you back. Did you have a big break? Was there a moment, you know, you say you've been here 11 years. Was there a moment a few years ago when you perhaps, maybe it was Royal Ascot, where you perhaps went from being a talented young designer to being someone who is you know now something of a name in the industry was there a moment for you when it changed uh, actually for me it was when you say it and it happens kind of stuff or you don't ask you don't get kind of thing that i mentioned my professor uh, jeff owen at london college of fashion i want to do london fashion week maybe i can do it sometime and then after two months he put me through the british fashion council and they told me i'm the first pakistani ever to showcase london fashion week so that was the Wow, that was what, what transformed after you. Because forgive my ignorance. I mean, as you can tell, I know about <laughs> fashion from my the way I'm dressed. I'm currently wearing an orange pinstripe shirt, uh, which is rather embarrassing. You can see evidence of that on our social media feed. But um, uh, how did that transform your career? Because obviously, being at London Fashion Week is a huge deal. It's a way of launching your name. What happened to you? How did it transform your fortunes and your career? Uh, I'm to be very honest. I'll say that. 
for me it was a fast track in a way as i just yes. mentioned it's no shortcut to success and yes. then i realized that from a b c i was jumping a to e directly so the b c d which i was missing was actually a drawback and i have to work very hard to cover the back law ah. yeah. so were some people in the industry somewhat uh uh did they sort of look down upon you because you'd been fast tracked did they say you've got to do the hard yards you've got to go through b c and d when you get from a to e i never get that revealed to the industry so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you you couldn't yeah you couldn't possibly say that tell me a bit about royal As- ascot how did you um come to work for royal ascot yeah this um there's a very famous stylist she has her studio in south kensington and she was the one i been introduced to through a friend and meeting her and she mentioned that she has some royal clientele on her list and she, five designers are working in the house with her who do base book couture for the clients and i could be the one so that's how she, I, i give the whole credit to the lady because she was the one who introduced me to the royalties and the royal escort are you allowed to say who this is i mean you're allowed to give her name she, she if she's done such good service for you i feel like she should get a plug on the asian network who are we talking about oh yeah um sarah mahafi Sarah Mahaffey. Okay, mm-hmm. so this you owe Sarah Mahaffey a great deal. Is it quite um it, compared to some other people that you've uh, designed for? What's it what's it like uh doing stuff for Royal Ascot because I in my ignorant way not know much about fashion, certainly not know very much about the royals, don't really know what is involved in designing for Royal Ascot. What's the basic task and was it unusual to them to have a, someone of Pakistani origin doing that? uh yeah and there's a big uh what you call guideline from the royal scot in itself that right. the dress code has to be on specific like this yeah you can't go out of that uh, guideline <laughs> so i like this year they made a big change in royal enclosure before you can't wear something less than 1.5 inches of uh width your strap of the dress couldn't be less than that but this year they actually bring it down to one inch hang on so this what so I, i'm sorry i'm struggling to uh, understand this because i don't i know so little about fashion but there was a rule saying you couldn't wear something less than what was 1.5 inches exactly the shoulder strap shoulder strap yeah. because why is that because if there's sorry i'm being really stupid here but if the shoulder strap is what less than 1.5 inches then it'll be too revealing basically that's the thing okay <laughs> but they've now changed the rules so now it's a slightly more revealing thing you <laughs> yes so when omar turns up let's change the rules let's make it easier for people to reveal a lot more and do you dress both again forgive my ignorance do you dress both men and women only women yes. only women okay uh, what sort of style have you tried to do because royal ascot as you say comes with this immense tradition uh a pakistani uh man uh, dressing the women at royal ascot is an unusual uh, combination how have you tried to influence or bring a uh, sort of change to royal ascot using the omar manzoor imprint uh women used to wear usually the very british kind of designers and british stuff with what that did d- describe what that is to people who don't know what british design looks yeah, okay it's mostly the prints they've been using like polka dots or if they plain clothes then they are wearing what you call, i call them boring fabrics <laughs> 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 so I came up with kind of hand woven fabrics and unique fabrics which are not very easily available in Europe and source them from back home and even in India. Ah so you use um, a lot of uh, materials back from Pakistan. Pakistan, India and Turkey. Pakistan is why those three countries because you know the garments are better quality. Yeah and hand woven culture is only there left. I mean you don't get this labor who do this hand woven uh, garment fabrics anymore. That's very interesting really. So you don't get good hand woven stuff so people in in the UK I thought the Middle East I thought other parts of the Middle East Israel and places like that you got fantastic hand woven stuff no? I never been to Israel neither <laughs> good context. <laughs> Maybe if you went it could be a life changing thing. Um I must ask about skirts because um uh, both Maisa and Govinda who work on this show uh, are, are keen to know more about the ladies fashion at Ascot. No doubt because they're planning to go some stage themselves. What is the um what's the length of skirt requirement? It's just above the knee. You can't go further up. It just has to finish the skirt on the knee. Okay, does that present challenges to a fashion designer or is it actually easy to work with those restrictions? It does in a way since I do bespoke garments so I don't do like a one size fits all so every woman come in a different size and different shape and it's not like uh, it's 20 cent- inches from the waist to the knee has to be some women it's 19 some 18 and they can be refused admission to the royal escort if it's just above the knee. Of course and there must be very strict application of those rules. So when you're doing I, I again I come to Royal Ascot with all the usual cultural stereotypes and baggage. Um the sort of hand woven fabrics that you're uh, in- introducing and the asian embellishments they take royal ascot in a very different direction to a tradition so there is a kind of conflict or tension maybe between the 
uh, inherited tradition of Royal Ascot and what you try and bring to it. That must be very interesting because you're kind of trying to change Royal Ascot, but you're doing it from within somehow. I luckily, I mean the. Um People who attend it every year, they mention, oh, I saw a lady wearing a dress and I was sure it's your dress because it was having that hand embroidered, uh, brooch kind of embroidery on it. And it has a very unique style, your style. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, every year there's a theme uh, about the colors. Like li this year I'm doing around ivory and lime green. Okay. So people know that if somebody's wearing something ivory with the kind of uh, an embroidered emblem on it, so it has to be my design. And so exactly, and it's a good job we put you in front of the green mic, which is what you're <laughs> taking now. It's perfectly in, in keeping with your style. Um, I got a couple of other questions about the fashion industry, if I may, and then a bit more about Pakistan. One is, what do you say to those people? And there are lots of people who say that fashion is the preserve of the very, very rich. That when people like me look at um, the sometimes quite extraordinary or ludicrous uh, creatures coming down a catwalk you think a i could never afford that b i would never wear it down the high street no one ever wears that stuff down the high street and c it doesn't look very comfortable so what do you say to that very particular criticism of the fashion industry which i've often heard that people say this is the preserve of uh, very wealthy people that have no grasp of reality when we talk about couture fashion you're very much right but again coming to the variability factor even a couture has to be wearable. Else. What is couture? For people who don't know what couture is. What, okay, what is so one one off piece of art, wearable piece of art. So a dress which is made for a specific clientele, we do like more than three fittings. First, we do the pattern and make it on a cheaper fabric, calico. Yep. We do a fitting. Once a client is ready, then we do a real expensive hand-woven fabric or whichever they want. Okay. And then we do two more fittings to make sure that fits the lady who's wearing it. Okay. And that stuff is... that One off. That's a one-off. That stuff is very expensive, you say. But it is. But there's a different fashion, if you like, a different fashion industry, which is everyday, day-to-day, -day, the stuff that you can get uh, buy on the high street, right? Yeah. And what's the, and that's the one that you're more interested in. So when you do the uh, catwalk show and some weird, weird kind of stuff comes out, uh, a lady is wearing a maybe a horn or something uh, out of uh, leopard skin. Yeah, or that's, what that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but then it's not all about... It's, you know, the designer is just communicating his vision and style through that catwalk. But when it's adopted to a ready-to-wear line or more diffusion line, then yeah. it's just the print being printed on the fabric, the leopard print. Right. And the top is made in a basic top, which can be wear every day. So some of the more outlandish things that you see on a catwalk aren't actually proposals for new types of dress. They're a way of uh, a designer expressing themselves. Yes, and it's for trickle down the fact that later on it's uh, adopted to the high street factor. And of course, because um, fashion is very, very competitive, uh, very, very competitive, uh, I suppose some people do more and more outlandish stuff to get noticed, right? Yes. You would never do that, would you yourself? <laughs> I never did it anyway on the catwalk. You <laughs> You never did it on the catwalk. You've never done a catwalk show. I, I've done quite a lot. A lot of catwalks. Yeah, but yeah. never did outlandish kind of something, which is. <laughs> you do actual wearable stuff. The other thing that I want to ask you about fashion is um, a, basically advice for me. I'm abusing my role here as the person in front of the mic and the host of this show. Um, I have a major problem, which is that I am quite fat, and I have I'm basically the shape of a penguin. So I've got um, I've got this band of fat around my belly that I cannot for the life of me remove I eat far too many gulab jamun and ras malai and all these things and I like food and therefore I can't lose weight how should and I'm a shortish man about five seven five eight yeah five eight if uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if I get my way how should shortish men who have uh, some a belly try to disguise it for instance should you wear someone said you should avoid horizontal stripes because horizontal stripes makes you look fatter you should wear vertical stripes because they make you pinstripes they make you look thin how should small fat men dress <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't agree with the fact that you're a fat <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely overweight, okay. I'm definitely overweight. so uh, dark colors i would always suggest dark. dark why is that that's interesting why dark they camouflage your bits and bobs <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so dark 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 Yes, okay. But if you wear a bright colour, then it shows the shape of the body that you might want to hide. Yeah. On top of that, it also shows the height factor. So if it's a dark colour, and if your tie is actually on the vertical stripes, yes, it does help again. It helps to lengthen you. Yes, exactly. And so I, I'll suggest to everyone. And also with the collar, the band of the collar has to be slightly high. So it makes your height go more 
uh, tall. It gives the effect that you're slightly taller than yours. You're slightly taller. Now I'm going to now look at you and see that you're wearing a you're wearing a simple. I mean, you're quite a tall man. You're what six foot one? Six, six, yeah. Six foot one, and you're fairly broad, but you're thin. You're annoyingly thin because <laughs> you're one of these people that I can tell just doesn't put on weight, which really annoys me. I can tell everyone's. Uh, but you're wearing a plain white shirt with quite a big collar. Yeah. And that big collar, why have you chosen it? Or if you, did you not think about it? You just wore a shirt for whatever reason. Well, I, I was working today in the studio and I just came. Down. <laughs> you haven't. Yeah, maybe this isn't the day to do a, a rigorous fashion analysis. Okay, and I, yeah. So if you're tall, if you're if you're fat and you want to hide your physique uh, in in clothes, wear dark colours and vertical stripes are thinning. Yes, that's fantastic. God, that's hugely reassuring. Um, I'm thinking about lots of uh, students listening to this show just after their Easter holidays, and they're thinking they would like to go to London College of Fashion. They would like to work with fabrics. They would like to be fashion designers, and they'd like to get really rich doing their own collections. What's your advice to young people who want to uh, break through in the industry? And also, second question, what's your advice to people from an Asian background who perhaps feel that you know it's a hard industry for people like them to break into? I'll answer the second question first. Sure. Uh, don't ever think that there's a barrier when it comes to a creative industry. Really? Yes, because if you're creative, if you're proving your mental, sorry, metal, that uh, whatever your style is, people buy it if it's available. If and it's- you don't feel that there's an, this, there's an issue of discrimination in the industry? Because, of course, there's the, the new editor of British Vogue, Edward Edinful, is a, is a, is a black man. Um, so you, you could, for, based on your experience, you could reassure people that the fashion industry is an equal opportunities employer. It is indeed. I mean, uh, in a city like London, when it comes to selecting a mayor, people go for yes. the option which suits them. So. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so exactly. And in terms of getting into the industry as a whole, how do you do that? How do you break through as a fashion person? As a fashion person, if you're creative, I will always suggest people to go for the 30-70 formula. 30% your collection should be outlandish, creative and something which is, may not be wearable. But the 70% has to be commercial with sales and which brings you the money back. You can't run a business just by doing shows and just by doing creativity. You have to have m- money incoming which you reinvest and everything. So go for 30-70 formula, definitely. I'll suggest. Okay, just before we take some music, I want to know what's been the way... I mean, you said that you had this big breakthrough. You had Royal Ascot. You obviously, I mean, you know, I know from Googling you vigorously before you came on that you have this very, very unique style. What, 11 years after coming over from Pakistan, what do you feel is the biggest sort of reason for the success that you've had? Um, a little bit of luck, a lot of hard work, meeting the right people, making the right contacts. What's been the formula for success for Omar Manzur? <laughs> We discussed the hard work side, but then you, you you need to know your customer. You can't always think that what you think is the right thing for the client. No, you have to understand what suits them, what they want, how they can be comfortably carrying it. Do you mean when you do stuff for individual customers? Yes. Yeah, because you do personalized individual stuff. Exactly. That sounds like a very good formula for success. What have you got coming up next? What, just before, I'm, I'm, I know we're going to take some music in a moment. What have you got coming up next? What are you working on at the moment? Uh, yeah, a resort wear collection which is coming up in, in, uh, next month. And then, of course, Escort will be there in, March, in June. In June. Good to see you. Omar, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you.